All right, welcome to COM 110 Introduction to Communications. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what communications actually is and go through and define some of the models and the terms that you're going to learn a little bit more about this semester. So the first thing we're going to do is define what exactly do we mean when we're talking about communication. There's a lot of different examples up here on the screen. We're going to go with the definition here at the bottom from the National Communication Association. This one's my favorite definition. I think it's just very all-encompassing of the many different factors that affect communication. So the process of using verbal and nonverbal messages to generate meaning within and across various cultures, contexts, and channels. So we're going to unpack a little bit of that definition. We're looking at both verbal and nonverbal. So not only what you say, but certainly how you say it. And when we get into our nonverbal unit, We'll talk all about, you know, not only like hand gestures, body posture, those are examples of nonverbal communication, but also what you wear, your use of space. Those are all things that also impact our communication with other people and things that we don't tend to think about. So we'll examine all of those dis different aspects a little bit later in the course. Then we're also going to look at different contexts. So depending on the person that you're talking to and the situation that you're in, Communication can be quite varied, and some of those factors can really impact how someone else receives a message. And then certainly cultural components. So things may have a particular meaning in your culture, but that same thing could have a very different meaning in a different culture. So we'll spend an entire unit looking at how culture impacts communication. And you'll actually have a chance to sort of um, go through your own culture. You'll pick a culture that you like or that you belong to, and you will kind of analyze how some of these different factors impact the way that you interact with other people in that culture and also outside of that culture. And then lastly, channels. So that's something that we're going to look at today, the many different channels through which we communicate. So that could be through the use of face-to-face -face communication. Maybe it's through text message. Maybe it's through social media. Those are all different types of channels that we use, and each one kind of comes with their own set of rules and regulations and kind of how we should or should not communicate and the many different ways that sometimes those messages get distorted as a result of the channel. So that's the definition that we're going to operate within this semester. You're going to see that communication is varied, it's very ambiguous, so there are a lot of places where it can go wrong. And hopefully throughout this course you're going to pick up some tips and tricks to try to make the most of your communication and be as effective as you can. All right. So let's think about why do we study communication? So what was the reason that you were required to take this course? And one of the big reasons that we study communication is we have to do it, right? So whether you're working with another person, you're working in groups, you are kind of living in society, those all require communication. So it really helps us increase interpersonal skills. That is consistently the number one thing that employers are looking for in a new employee. They can teach you the technical skills. They have plenty of people who know how to do the job. But the idea that someone can come in and work well with others and be on time and have that great interpersonal connection, those are skills that are very hard to teach. We call those soft skills. And that's something that employers are really looking for, especially in this day and age. Also want to create shared meaning. So you will hear me talk about this later in the course, but one of my favorite examples of this is the idea of being late. So when I say we need to be on time, well, what does on time mean? If we don't create shared meaning, we could have very different interpretations of that particular phrase, and that could lead to some communication sort of issues or some, maybe some interpersonal conflict. So let's say Sam here. Sam believes being on time is showing up at 2 o'clock, the assigned time. Well, myself, I'm someone who believes being on time is showing up 10 minutes early. My youngest sister, Carla, thinks that being on time is showing up anywhere within 30 minutes of late. So as long as she was there by 2.30, she's happy. So those are all very different definitions of a term on time. So if we don't take the a sort of moment to create a shared definition, meaning when we say on time, we mean everyone needs to be physically at the place by the assigned time, then we might have some interpersonal issues. So just something that really helps us keep groups working as well as they can. They improve relationships, obviously persuasion, huge part of communication, especially these days, and we'll get into some messaging um, and how we can critically evaluate those, and that just helps us make sense of our surroundings. 
So these are all reasons why we'd want to study communication and we find value in that study. So this particular video is really going to focus on communication models. So we're going to look at three different models of communication and before we begin, I'm going to go through and define some of the terms that you're going to see in your textbook. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with how do two people communicate? We have a sender and receiver. So those are not always individuals. Sometimes it can be text that is quote unquote the sender. Sometimes it can be um, an individual or a group that's a receiver. So senders and receivers, somebody's sending a message and somebody's receiving it. The next one is that communicators must share a common experience of simple language in order to effectively communicate. An easy example of this, do you share the same language? If not, it might be really hard to communicate effectively. Certainly you could do it through use of hand gestures and symbols and all kinds of things, but obviously that would be much easier if we shared the same language. Um, same thing if we have some of the same cultural understandings. We'll take, the, we're living in the South right now, we'll take the term bless your heart. Well, bless your heart has a very specific meaning in the South, and that's not necessarily a nice meaning. But if you went to another culture and you told someone, oh, bless your heart, they might think you were really, you know, being very nice to them and you might have a very different meaning. So we want to make sure we have some shared understanding. And the context of the communication, it can impact how that communication is received. So if our sender and our receiver are trying to have a very serious conversation in the middle of a Starbucks, maybe pre-pandemic, um, it's a very noisy atmosphere. There are a lot of people around. So that might influence their ability to really have a good conversation because of all the noise factors. A couple other terms we want to look at. So if we have our sender and receiver, what are they sending? They're sending a message. So just whatever the content of that communication interaction is. They're also going to choose a way to send that message and that is called a channel. So when we're thinking about a channel, that is the way that you've chosen to send the information, whether that's through talking, maybe you are writing it down, maybe you're sending a text message, maybe you are posting it on Instagram. Those are all different channels of communication. So you wanna make the choice that's most effective for getting your message across. So again, some other examples there. Um, when we're thinking about channels, you know, think about the limitations of some of the channels. So if you need to have a serious conversation, again, I might not you do that via text message. That might feel easier because it's less risk to me, but that might be a better thing to have a face-to-face -face or a phone conversation about. Okay, and then the process of encoding and decoding. So the process of encoding is when the sender sort of does this process, right? They pick what they're gonna say, so the message, then they pick how they're going to send it. They pick the channel. And then they package it all up and send it over to the receiver. The receiver does a process called decoding. And that's when they interpret the message. So they interpret what the person was trying to say. And they use all their available clues. So they use the content of the message. They use the channel. Maybe they use some additional things like nonverbal communication, et cetera. So that is the process of encoding and decoding. And again, you'll get a little bit more detail about this in your chapter, but just kind of wanted to break down some of those different terms. So the first model we're gonna talk about is the linear model of communication. This is the most basic model. It's pretty outdated at this point, um, but there is one or two instances where you'll still see this linear model used. So the linear model says, here's our source. They package the message in the channel and the receiver received it. So it's a one-way style of communication. We know from communicating with others that communication is rarely one way. Um, and it doesn't really account for anything impacting the receipt of the message. So the only really good example of a linear style of communication that we still see today would be a billboard. So I've chosen a Chick-fil-A billboard here. So the source would be, you know, the ad agency at Chick-fil-A decided, okay, we're going to put this on this particular billboard on this particular road in this particular state. So they chose the message, what's listed here, and they chose the channel, the visual billboard. You as the receiver are gonna drive by, you are gonna interact with that message, but it's, we're never gonna close the loop, right? So you're never gonna send feedback back to Chick-fil-A unless you wanted to contact them and then that would be a different model of communication. But this is a great example of one-way communication. Source creates the message, puts the message out there, receiver receives the message, 
but that's where the communication ends. So again, this or maybe a print advertisement in a magazine are two of the best examples of linear communication and really the only examples we see today. Other than that, it's pretty outdated. The next model of communication got a little bit further. So when we decided the linear model didn't quite account for all of the different things that we're seeing when people communicate, we came up with the interactional model. So it adds a few extra terms. It says that not only does the source send a message to the receiver, but as humans, we're also giving feedback to the source. So we're sending messages back. So for example, if I was trying to have a very serious conversation with you about, you know, whatever, maybe you're great. So I am verbally telling you something, it's face to face. Well, the entire time I'm giving you this message, you're sending a message back. Maybe if your arms are crossed, you're going to tell me you're upset. Um, if you're looking down, maybe you're going to tell me that, you know, you're a little, not ashamed, but maybe not so happy with the content of this message. So you're giving me the message back, but through a different channel. Or maybe you're verbally responding. That would also be a way in which this particular model would, enter, would work. The one reason that we don't still see this as the current model of communication is because it doesn't account for one particular term, and that is noise. So noise and feedback are two pieces that are missing from the interactional model. So feedback, think that's any response to a message. So again, just like I was talking about the idea of your body posture could be feedback. When you are listening to a speaker, you might be giving them feedback by nodding your head or maybe again, your body posture. Gosh, if you're in class and you're so bored, you're like this all over the chair or maybe you're falling asleep. That's all feedback to the, the source, the person that's speaking um, that lets them know you're just not super engaged. So it can be verbal or nonverbal. Again, you can respond to the message or you can send that message nonverbally. We'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about public speaking. So the other thing that the interactional model doesn't account for is noise. And noise is anything that interferes with the accurate receipt of a message. So that means this is something that maybe impacts how someone takes that information. So there are a couple of different things that could impact that decoding process or that receipt of a message. I call them the three P's and an S, easy way to remember it. So the first type of noise is the hardest one for you as a speaker or as someone who's trying to communicate with somebody else to get rid of. Psychological noise, these are thoughts, feelings, emotions. These are anything that sort of come up as you're having that interaction. So let's take an example. Let's say you have a very difficult relationship with your mother. So it doesn't matter what she says to you, sort of the context of that relationship and, and your previous history and your patterns of communication are always gonna impact how that communication process takes place, right? She could say, you look lovely today, and what you hear is, go change your clothes, you look terrible, right? Just because you have a very specific um, you know, background with that person and you're hearing some of what they're saying through a different lens. So that could be psychological noise. So it could also be, if we're taking a classroom example, maybe you're sitting in class and you're trying to listen to the speaker or the professor, but you are super hungry. I don't know about you, but being hungry really affects me. That or if I'm cold, I have trouble concentrating. Maybe you have a test next bell, so you are freaking out about that. So those could all be examples of psychological noise. Very difficult to get rid of. Um, we do try to, when we're communicating with someone, we try to leave some of our past history with them at the door so we can take what they're saying at face value, but very hard to do. Another P is physiological noise. So if you know anything about like biology, physiology is a component, so these are things that happen within the body. Um, so physiological noise could be hearing loss. Maybe you're having trouble communicating with someone because they have tr trouble hearing you. Heavy accents could be an example of physiological noise. So this might not be one you experience very often, um, but could be something that you deal with. Physical noise. So if you are, again, trying to have a serious conversation in a Starbucks, you've got people ordering, you've got people working and talking and drinks being made, there's a lot of noise going on. If you've ever tried to have a conversation in your home, especially if you have kids, you've got kids screaming, TV's on, maybe the dog's barking, 
physical noise is just any noise that you can hear. And that really affects some people more than others, but certainly can be an issue when you're trying to communicate effectively. And then lastly is semantic. And that's just a fancy way of saying jargon. So it's very easy for us to get rid of semantic noise. We just need to put things in layman's terms. So if you are a gamer, for example, you probably have very specific terms that are unique to the gaming world. I am not, so I'm not gonna know any of them. Um, but if you just came up to me and started talking and using those terms, I would be completely lost. I wouldn't be able to receive and interpret that message correctly because I don't have the knowledge. You can very easily get rid of that noise by just explaining what those terms mean. So very easy to do. So these are all the things that can impact the receipt of a message. And these are represented in the model that we now see as sort of the ideal model of communication, and that is the transactional communication model. So as you can see, both the sender and receiver send and receive messages. So we've got its two-way. Um, these messages are being sent through channels. And here you can see that noise is coming in and impacting the different kind of receipts of this message. So noise can be kind of messing it up all over the place. So this is just a fancy way of showing you that communication is very complex. It's very easy to have miscommunication because we have so many things that could impact what's being transmitted and how it's being received. So it's definitely something that we want to think about as we um, transition into looking at communication for the rest of the semester. So I hope this has given you a great overview of some of the communication models and terms that you're gonna see in your textbook and kind of prepped you to think about how we're going to expand on each of these different parts through the rest of the semester.